You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. When you look at a standing dog, it's easy to think that that duke claw doesn't do anything because it doesn't make contact with the ground. And so it's easy to go like, it's up there. Why would you even need to worry about it? Um, so might, might as well take it off to try to prevent problems. But then as people started to question that, which questioning things is a good thing, um, then we started to go, oh yeah, but if you actually look at dogs in motion or dogs doing certain activities that, you know, grabbed with their feet, that maybe they do use it. Hey, bird dog babes. My name is Courtney Vashton, and I am obsessed with all things bird dogs. And I'm here with you to share the stories, experiences, knowledge, and opinions from the women and a few guys in the industry that are killing it. I'm a Wisconsin girl living in a Montana world. I'm mom and two incredible kiddos, wife and occasional assistant to a pro gun dog trainer, traveling the U.S. talking about canine nutrition while hunting, breeding, and competing with my German wire hair pointers and Bracco Italianos. As someone who started hunting later in life because I wanted to give my dogs the opportunity to do what they were bred to do, I'm here to help inspire, educate, and connect women to get their bird dogs out in the field and experience a bond like no other. So pour yourself a glass of wine and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Bird Dog Babe Podcast. Happy Cinco de Mayo! Hey, when there's an actual reason to celebrate with Mexican food and margaritas, I am here here for it. Today we are unpacking the hot topic of dew claws. Should we as breeders remove them at a few days old or should we leave them on? That is the question. In this episode, Dr. Sarah Schull, a sports medicine and rehab veterinarian at the Michigan State University, teaches us all about the anatomy and function of the dew claw. I appreciate Sarah's approach on this topic as to not be pushing a bias one way or another, and instead she just simply lays out all the factors and terms for each of us to take into consideration. Whether you are a breeder or an owner, I guarantee you're going to learn something from this one. So I know my opener says to pour yourself a glass of wine, but to celebrate Cinco de Mayo, go ahead and salt up that rim and make yourself a margarita for this one. Okay, let's get after it. Thank you to our sponsor, Dakota 283, unparalleled protection for traveling to and from your favorite hunting spot. Dakota 283 kennels are a premium quality roto mold with recessed handles on top for convenient and safe tie down. It makes it easy to lift up into the truck. I love the secure door frame with high security locks so I know my dogs are safe when I need to stop for fuel. An added bonus are the drain holes in the back which make cleaning a breeze when your dog has been run hard and put away wet. Head over to dakota283.com and enter promo code BIRDDOGBABE for a 10% discount to all my listeners. Okay, today we are talking with Dr. Sarah Scholl. How are you doing, Sarah? Great, thank you. Thanks for coming on today. I'm so excited to have you. Wonderful. So, Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do. Absolutely. So, I am with the uh, Michigan State University Sports Medicine and Rehab Service, mainly run, run out of our small animal clinical sciences department, um, but I do a little bit of large animal rehab um, with our um, colleagues as well. I um, have the opportunity there to um, teach through all four years of the curriculum as well as um, have a busy rehab service seeing patients. I've been there about five years now. Uh, Previously, I spent 17 years in a busy private practice with a big focus on purebred dogs. We did a lot of reproduction um, as well as sports medicine and rehab there. Graduated um, what seems like a long time ago, but really probably not that long ago, in 1999 from Michigan State. um, And quickly, um, kind of accidentally on purpose, ended up um, getting 
wonderful field trial retriever experience. Um, had some opportunities to travel with um, some professionals to nationals right out of the gate, right as a new veterinarian, which sparked my love of all things field dog, as well as the sports medicine part about being a veterinarian. Um, myself personally got involved with um, the German wire hair pointer breed 2002 um, and didn't even know what wool meant or any of those things but I thought that if you get a dog that has a some type of field ability you should give them the chance and so through exploring that dog's potential in 2002 throughout his first couple of years of, of life um, that has taken me through um, you know, all the hunt test venues, all the field trial venues, um, both with retrievers and pointers, um, currently have curly coated retrievers that I run in hunt tests and field trials, as well as the, the cute, adorable, most of the time, um, <laughs> angelic, um, wire hair pointer that I have now. Um, and then I also, um, am a all age field trial retriever judge. Um, so that gives me an opportunity to really see kind of have the best seat of the house in the house. Um, so I've been able to, to merge my hobbies and my profession quite nicely. So no complaints for Very me cool. as, far as that goes whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And you do some judges ed as well, don't you? Cause I know you've helped with the wire hairs. Do you do the same for the curly coats? I actually do it for all breeds. So through the AKC, um, program here in Michigan. We've had a sporting breed education um, seminar that's gained quite good attendance and popularity. I think we've been doing it about seven or eight years now, and it's the only one in the U.S. that has a field component as well. So I run the field portion for all the breeds and give the AKC confirmation judges an opportunity to see the different breeds, um, pointer spaniels, um, and retrievers working both in a on a land-based setup and a water-based setup, so they can see how the structure and breed standards work. So they actually do even get That's performance awesome. credit as a judge uh, watching the different hunt test venues. They're very well attended, um, mm -hmm. exciting, very fun, um, and the dogs certainly love it as well. So it's been a, a very program that we run every year in Michigan um, and has has been a, a great opportunity for me something I'm not quite sure how I got in charge of but uh, <laughs> I don't think I think it's one of those things you never get un in charge of um, so right. yes I currently do that every year so it and that is um is that in June uh this year we're actually uh, merged it with our big sporting dog um, show. So okay. we're actually, the plan would be that it would be over the 4th of July holiday ish. Um, so it was the first, it's the planning, the plan for it would be that the field portion would, and the judges ed portion would be the Thursday before the Friday show. So that's a change that we had made this year, not because of this, what's going on in the world, but um, because of uh, different venues and, and wanting to make sure we capitalize on as many people that can get the opportunity to see it happening and such. So this mm -hmm. year, this year, the plan is to do it um, in conjunction with the big sporting dog show. Okay. Very nice. That'll be a good opportunity for people to get their hands on uh, more of the confirmation side as well as the, the field side then. Do you guys, how many judges do you typically get in for that event? I think we've had, you know, it's usually a hundred, like 90 to 150, I believe, um, wow. you know, kind of waxing and waning different breeds um, have more than others. And I think we've almost had every breed in the sporting group in attendance. So I can't say that we've ever had a year that they all have been, but boy, do we get pretty darn close. So mm -hmm. we have, it's a huge weekend. Um, the club's really put a lot of work and time and effort into it. Um, and the judges just are glowing about the opportunity to get to have so much hands-on with the dogs, especially mm -hmm. some of the less common breeds, you know, like the curly coated retriever, they might not have the opportunity to see many in a show ring um, geographically, but we can bring them, you know, 12 to 25 dogs um, of different ages and structure and coat and such. And so there's a lot of breeds that, really um, show off quite nicely so that judges have the opportunity. And we do it in small groups um, over 
the weekend, the judges have, um, I'm trying to count, eight opportunities to be with the breed um, in the show ring um, over the weekend. Because right. so. there's different time slots then, so they can only choose eight? Exactly. Yep. So okay. there, I, I think the most judges that I've ever seen in a group is only like four to maybe six at the very most. So it's very one-on-one mm. you know, -on -one with the mentors and with the dogs. And so it's, it's a great opportunity. And then from 11 to one each day, um, we run the field events. Sometimes it's just as simple as getting to see the dogs wet, you know, for example, like our, our golden retrievers, um, we have a wonderful demo um, who demos every year for us, you know, who's a grand champion and is also accomplished in the, in the field. And so even just getting to see a fully coated um, show golden retriever swim or, you know, our, our show clumber spaniels, for example, seeing them, you know, cover an upland field and, we have a favorite Sussex Spaniel that, that also is a grand champion that likes to show off. Um, in the <laughs> so um, they, they, the judges really get a lot um, out of it. They get to see braces of pointers honoring each other. They get to see retrieves and points and flushes and all sorts of things. And also to demonstrate the versatility of so many of the breeds because they'll see them demonstrate in water and on land. Mm -hmm. Is that something that um, judges can expect to see every single dog in the AKC sporting group there? Do you guys have breed reps for all of them? It's pretty close. Okay. I mean, each, each year there's a handful that there'll be a conflict one way or another. Or they just can't um, get the, the right people in the right places. But geez, there's, I want to say there's usually at least 18 to 20 breeds represented each time. So okay. it's a, it's a good group. Mm -hmm. And I think even if I remember right, this last year I saw that the Broncos were there and they're not even recognized yet. So yep. they must be and, open up to that. Yep. And all the breeds as they've become more popular um, within confirmation or the field. So we've had, you know, wire hair Vizlas in these past couple of years. We had the, the Quakers, um, in these past couple of years, we've had a lot of different um, breeds that are not your common, you know, sporting group breeds um, at Judges Ed as well. So that's been a great opportunity as well and, and fun for me to see him in the field because I might not get to see him that often either. Mm -hmm. Where can people find out about that if they want to get more information um, on how to attend it? So the Michigan Sporting Dog Association, um, okay. WICA, is, is the one that leads that. Um, the information would be just going out and kind of assembling right about now. And then certainly any of the Michigan-based uh, sporting dog clubs usually have a big presence at it as well. So if there's a certain breed that you're um, associated with, reaching out to the local clubs, they usually are in the loop. Um, as much as possible. Okay. Or well, me. For sure. There's, al there's always me. You can just always contact me. <laughs> <laughs> and how can we contact you, Sarah? <laughs> so don't give us your personal he, phone number, but <laughs> no, no, not to worry. I, I don't answer it anyways. Um, so, so for me, I, I'm never opposed to having people reach out to me on Facebook as silly as that sound. Um, I don't find it intrusive of it all and I have no problem saying no if I find it to be so it's Sarah Schull um, S-H-U-L-L-L-U-L-L -L -L -L, I can't even spell my own last name and um, my uh, Facebook account's public so um, I'm reachable there and then okay. a personal email address if anybody would like it it's just DVM at msu.edu so I never mind, um, especially sporting dog questions. Um, I'll take all dog questions, but if I'm doing it for fun, sporting dog questions are the most fun for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. So I wanted to dive into the topic um, today with you about dew claws, not only because of your experience and expertise uh, in canine sports medicine, but also um, something that came to my mind when I thought of this topic was back in 2013 when you had contacted me about a German wire hair pointer. One of your very first questions to me was, 
do you leave dew claws on your puppies? Mm -hmm. And, and so I knew, um, you know, that there was something there that you had experience with and yeah. And so I want you, um, and we never really dug into it at that time, but Mm -hmm. I would like to go into that with you a little bit today. So tell me about the dew claw and the importance of that in, um, in sporting dogs and bird dogs and our hunting dogs. Absolutely. And this is a conversation that I have with people very often in the exam room or at different field events or kind of anywhere. Um, And, uh, you know, really in the last, you know, five to six years, has it become more of a conversation? Um, Initially, you know, everybody just took do claws off in this country because that's just what we did. And, And I don't know the history of that as, I mean, how that all started, but definitely over the years um, that I've been paying attention, it certainly was almost like, you know, if you didn't have the dew claws removed, then somehow you were being irresponsible, like you forgot to do that or something like that. So you'd see litter postings for field dogs that would, you know, first vaccines and dew claws removed and dewormed, like it was, Mm -hmm. you know, what responsible people did. And then over my years in practice, people started to not necessarily just do it as routinely or at least start questioning kind of, do we have to do this? Like, what is the, where did this come from and and why do we do it and such like that? And then certainly more and more discussion then have led to um, the actual, okay, well, let's find out a little bit more about the Duclaw and think this through and, and talk about it a little more. And so, you know, the Duclaw itself is a digit, you know, the, the front leg of a dog, um, the front paw of a dog has five digits and the dew claw does have um, bones associated with it. It has, you know, tendinous uh, attachment associated with it as well as nerves and blood supply attached to it as well. It's similar to our thumb, but obviously not um, is, as, as, as much dexterity with it as our thumb that we are different than dogs. Um, And I think initially the, the kind of flippantness about the dew claw removal was that when you look at a standing dog, it's easy to think that that dew claw doesn't do anything because it doesn't make contact with the ground. And so it's easy to go like it's up there. Why would you even need to worry about it? Um, So might, might as well take it off to try to prevent problems. But then as people started to question that, which questioning things is a good thing, um, then we started to go, oh, yeah, but if you actually look at dogs in motion or dogs doing certain activities that, you know, grabbed with their feet, that maybe they do use it. Um, And obviously, you know, Mother Nature puts us parts for an original reason, whether or not the dogs are still used for those reasons or not, um, is, you know, very individual, but certainly it was there for a purpose and has attachments that are anatomic. Now, that being said, um, there are many dogs that have had them removed for years that were not seeing, you know, huge issues and things like that with them. So the Duclaw itself is an anatomic structure. It has bones, muscles, tendons, um, attached to it. Um, by muscles, I mean through the tendinous structure. And, you know, it does have a purpose in movement. Um, and you can, you know, Google all sorts of um, slow motion videos of, you know, dogs running and, and things like that. And you can see the, the contact being made with it in the ground. Mm-hmm. I think where I noticed it the very first time, um, we were actually playing just retrieve with a couple of dogs along a riverbank. And one of those dogs was an import that had dew claws and our other one did not have them. And when they were both coming back on the retrieve, climbing up the bank, the one with dew claws, you could see how he just time and time again, he would just dug in and came straight up that bank. And mm-hmm. the, our female that did not have the dew claws she she tried to go up the bank and then she'd kind of go backwards and then start running along each side trying to find an easier route to get up the bank. Um, right. So that was the first time I actually noticed of 
the functioning of that dew claw. It was mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and now that there's more and more discussion about this out in the world, there's all sorts of, you know, videos out there and, you know, examples of, you know, how dogs may or may not use their dew claws and, and different function and, and such like that. And it's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard sometimes to make absolute decisions based on that, but at least as you're delving into the decisions for yourself and your own dog, um, you at least can get a better picture of what the function may be for your breed or your purpose of dog or um, your purposes in general. Mm -hmm. So hunting wise, um, the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say hunting wise, we, when we were in Wisconsin, we hunted a lot up in um, the Northern woods for rough grouse and, woodcock and in that type of terrain it was pretty thick and um, I think in about 2013 was our last litter that we took dew claws, dew claws off with and um, we hadn't we haven't personally had any troubles with dogs that we have dew claws on um, and mm -hmm. the, the one dog that we did have a problem with was one that had hers removed as a puppy, but missed that inner digit portion yes. when it was taken off. And so when we hunted her, she would actually get very sore and even bloody um, after day one because of that little bone that was still sticking out. And, and that's a good point to bring up as well is that the, as you look into the anatomy of the dew claw, that's important whether you're removing them or not removing them because if you're removing them realizing that that's not just a little toenail that you're trimming off you're doing a digit amputation now you're performing it when they're three to five days old and it's a very um uh, can be a very uh, safe and um with appropriate pain um medication and, and such like that can be a very humane procedure at the age doing it the right way but you also do have to take into account that there is a lot of of anatomy that goes into that little thing and so if if you're going to remove dew claws um which is can still be a very appropriate in my opinion thing to do um make sure you do it the right way because the worst cases that i've seen have been exactly like you just mentioned is not the if they had them or if they didn't it's the ones that didn't get removed appropriately. Um, I have one of those at, at home as well. I didn't do the, the dew claw removal. The grow back ones are, are, have been in my just experience without literature to support it. Um, those grow back ones have been way worse than any dew claw injuries that I've seen in practice. And so removing them can be a very, very good alternative to leaving them, but just make sure know your anatomy and respect the anatomy of that area and realize that it growing back can be, you know, quite painful as well. Right. And while that's typically a veterinary procedure, um, it's still something that breeders are doing at home. Oh, absolutely. Every day of the yeah. week. Right. So um, how can they find out how to do that properly? Well, in, in this state, um, in Michigan, um, it's technically a veterinary procedure, so it's actually would not even be legal for me to teach somebody to do it correctly. Okay. okay. Um, because it actually, and, and most states apply to this as well, it's actually practicing veterinary medicine. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in Michigan that does that on their own dogs is is wrong or, you know, you know being rogue and, and illegal. Um, but certainly it's, it's nothing that um, should be taken lightly um, in that it is a surgical procedure. And at least in our practice act, um, you'd have to have a really good relationship with someone to um, not make it license risky. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. Um, what about rear dew claws? Some breeds are born with them. Yes, some breeds are born with them, and it's definitely within their breed standard to keep 
from. Um, you know, and originally with those breeds, um, you know, there's also very many proposed, you know, original purposes and such like that as far as climbing and rocky surfaces and all sorts of stuff. But as far as your typical day-to-day -day dog or if a rear Duclaw shows up in most of our sporting breeds, they are considered um, more of an abnormality. Um, and typically, and this is where rear Duclaws kind of they just do what they want as far as I'm going to say typically if a sporting breed does have a rear Duclaw, it's going to be um, a much looser connection than a front Duclaw with less anatomic attachments in a tight formation. And so most of the rear Duclaws in sporting breeds, at least, um, we end up removing those because they're not as attached and tight to the front um, legs like the front Duclaws are. Okay. And there's got to be a function of them, I'm sure. Most of the time when we see them, um, they're just a, a aberration as far as, you know, one rear Duclaw and one puppy in a litter or something like that. So in mm -hmm. curly coat, we do get them once in a while and we do remove those routinely. Okay. That they're not eye appealing at all. <laughs> they, they're typically no. more like just big and floppy, aren't they? And they're not, they're not, they don't seem as high up located. They're, right. they're actually in the same location. Okay. It's just, you're just, um, the hawk pointiness um, draws your eyes to that a little differently. But they're very yeah. similar um, in their location as far as between the metacarpals or the metatarsals. If you were actually to measure that bone specifically, it just is a total different visualness, front versus rear. They're not pretty. <laughs> in, in, but if you had great Pyrenees, you would think they were beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there are, right, so I guess outside of bird dogs, there are a couple breeds that um, I think they're required to stay, aren't they? Or they're yes. required in the, in the standard. Um, yep, ex exactly. Yeah. And even Birds, a double Pyrenees. version. Yep. A double version. So yeah, Great Pyrenees, for example, and, and don't quote me on this as far as not to offend any Great Pyrenees people, I, I adore them and have a bunch of them as wonderful patients, but mm -hmm. my understanding is that their breed standard is double Duclaws, which is um, a handful of other um, breeds in, in that group as well, where it's actually two um, coming out of the same um, close attachment. So it's actually double Duclaws in the rear. Hmm. So, which, like I said, on a Pyrenees, it's beautiful. If my German wire pointer had that, I would think he's more of an alien than sometimes he is. <laughs> <laughs> um, how often do you see, or hear, I should say, of Duclaw injuries? Are they pretty typical? So I, in preparation for this call, I actually tried to think about that. And so I've been a vet for 21 years, and I can't think of a single dewclaw injury that sticks out in my mind. I'm sure that it's happened. I'm sure that there's been a broken toenail on a dewclaw. I'm sure that I've treated a dewclaw injury at some point, but there's, never, there's not one that sticks out in my mind of some horror story. Now, that's me. That's one veterinarian practicing most of my career all in one area of Michigan, but being very involved all over the country and even in other countries with, with field dogs. So I'm sure I've treated some broken dew claws, but none have stood, stood out. The problem with the uh, and where I think a lot of this discussion comes out of is that for the people that have had these injuries, because of the attachments and, and where um, that is on the, the dog's leg, when they've had injuries, they have been pretty significant injuries. So that's where you hear the, the horror stories of, you know, the dogs bleeding to death or, you know, severe pain and, and different things like that because of where it is on the, the leg. I personally have not had that happen. I've had many people tell me about their previous experiences with bad experiences like that. And so I have no reason not to believe them. It, it definitely can happen. Um, but digits one through five, so dew claw to, to outer toe, um, 
are significant sources of potential injuries because of how they contact the ground and, and the world. I mean, they really are the, the probably underdiagnosed area of the dog in general. And so if a dog can get injured, certainly there's no reason to think that any of the digits couldn't sustain a pretty significant injury that involves pain and um, blood supply and everything like that. And so not in, do claw injuries shouldn't be taken lightly either. Um, and certainly a lot of what we do with our dogs um, is based on our past experiences as well. Okay. In the, in the injuries that would typically result from it, what would that be? Yeah. Just getting stuck on something, getting, um, I mean, I guess that would go as much with function of them. Yeah, so definitely getting stuck and ripped. Um, if you can imagine, you know, jamming your own thumb, you know, backwards and, and your thumb staying in one place and the rest of you going a different direction, um, you know, that, that can be significant, um, certainly. And as I talk to um, colleagues in other fields, um, as far as uh, say like the sled dog groups or even the greyhound groups and such like that, um, they, they very much remove dew claws in, in the vast majority of their populations because an injury to their dogs doing what they are doing, um, you know, constantly, you know, crunching through snow or even just, you know, putting booties on or things like that, an injury could be significantly career ending or limiting. And you might be in remote areas that um, that's just not an option. Or you might be managing, you know, 200 um, head of dogs in a kennel and you, you just can't run that risk. And so there are still many groups of people that through this discussion, they very much are pro Duclaw removal. Um, and I certainly support that for their reasons that are potentially different from the individual hunting dogs that, that I've been able to make the decision in my dogs to, to not remove the Duclaws, but there's reasons to remove Duclaws based on past experiences as well, as, and as well as what terrain or what um, you're managing as far as your kennel or your, your, your sport. Right. Looking at, um, you know, if I, as a breeder, when I'm looking at um, advantages versus disadvantages, if I'm thinking, well, if I just remove the dew claws on all these puppies now to prevent injury, how would that weigh itself versus mm -hmm. leaving the dew claw on and the functional, I'm sorry, the function ability yeah. that, that that is going to provide for uh, these puppies as a personal gun dog or competitive field trial dog. How mm -hmm. could I, how can I weigh that decision? Absolutely. And, and how we do it as veterinarians making recommendations as well as with our own personal um, companions and breeding dogs is that some of it is a collection of experiences and what you can sleep well at sleep well with at night about it because they are your personal individual um, decisions made for your dogs and your breeding stock going into these um, homes and then the second would be to consult the, the current literature and so most of our decision making based on advantages and disadvantages in this conversation of do clause does come from opinions and past experiences. So just to make sure I was up to date on, on everything that's published on this stuff right now. I did an actual lit search looking for, you know, peer reviewed research based on should we leave them on or should we not in dogs. And as far as an actual lit search, um, it's limited. There was a paper in 2018 that was a client-based survey going back and looking at digit injuries. So do they injure their toes? And one of the things they looked at as a factor was do dogs that, in agility dogs specifically, if they had front dew claws or didn't have front dew claws, did they show they had more injuries or not? And they did um, very mildly correlate not 
having dew claws um, with a higher chance of injury to your other digits. But in that same paper, they also showed that dew claws were the least likely digit of all five in the dogs that did have them to get injured. And they actually correlated nail length, so just trim your dog's nails, to um, longer nails having higher rates of injuries, even more so than having a dew claw or not. And so in that one study, which was all going back and just asking for information, it showed that having dew claws had less injuries to their other digits, but it was um, still a fairly loose, and even the authors themselves would say you should probably leave dew claws, but they also wanted to make the point of, and, you know, dew claws themselves weren't um, at a higher rate of injury, and you should probably trim your dog's nails, and you should make sure you choose the right height to weight ratio for running agility dogs. And there were all these other factors that rolled into if they had digit um, injuries or not to any digit of their front foot. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with any type of research, and like I said, that was the paper I found, period, um, is that we still don't have any research that's published that actually is what's called a prospective study or anything that is double blinded or has a control. So the only way for any of us to make an absolute, you should do this or you should not do this, would be if we set up a study where, you know, a bunch of dogs being used for a bunch of different purposes, you know, had one dew claw removed on one side and not a dew claw removed on the other so that we could have a control versus not, and then follow those dogs lifelong. Hmm. No. In, and, and it's hard even to what's called blind a study about dew claws versus not having dew claws because it's a very easy topic to even get blind, uh, biased in research about because there's no way to uh, hide the fact that a dog has or doesn't have dew claws. So you're already a little bit biased going into a study trying to evaluate it unless you set it up going forward instead of always looking backwards at things. So not to say that that study isn't, isn't great. It gives us information, but that's the one bit of absolute literature to help us make decisions when you actually do a, an actual literature search. Now contrast that to doing a Google search on this topic. And you could, I mean, I stopped after page five as far as tons of really good um, reputable scientific people with very strong experience based opinions um, that are valid. I mean, they're great, um, great veterinarians, great breeders, great scientists um, that have very strong opinions and have a collection of experience that is very extremely valuable, but that's how we're making our decisions. And so, you know, your experience, Courtney, with your breeds is valuable in decision making, as well as, you know, the people with sled dogs who, you know, have been removing them and will continue to remove them, I, I assume, potentially forever, um, or the great seeing people that it remove them um, because of the risk associated with them as well. But that's where we stand as far as decision making is that we're all going off of opinions of some really, you know, educated and scientific people, but you can find that same collection of information either to do it or not to do it and still be this, uh, a valid collection of experience and um, education that I certainly am not going to tell them they're wrong. I can help advise individual clients and individual kennels and breeders with what I think works best for them to feel the best at going forward. And I've had a lot of my breeders over the last 20 years change even their opinions as far as, you know, I don't think I've had anybody go from not removing dew claws to removing dew claws on everybody, but I certainly have had a, a handful of um, sporting breed um, 
breeders that over the years have definitely gone from always removing them on every litter to now going to the, the not removing them, similar to what mm. your experience has been as well. So that was the long answer to um, every answer can be right. Um, and until we have absolute true research on this topic that helps us make that decision, then we all can justify it with as much information as you can get on this topic to make the decisions for you and, and your breed and, and your puppy owners. Right. And I think being somebody that um, from our first litter in 2007 till we, our last one that we took them off in 13, it was just something like you said was a routine practice for us. It was, mm-hmm. you, you remove the dew claws, you dock the tails and vaccines, all the stuff. And yep. I didn't even think of it until we had the imports come over that had them. And after a while, I did see, you know, the difference in what they use them. But I also had that mentality of, I show my dogs, they're in confirmation. Right. And it's going to be a cleaner, prettier look if yep. I would um, have them removed. But I'm completely guilty of saying that without even mm-hmm. knowing what they had actually looked like if I had left them. Yes. And um, there really is no difference. And I, and I have, I just want to bring up a, a story of, um, a good friend of ours that we co-breed with and in the first litter that we co-bred with him of a female, we removed the dew claws. The second one had been over that transition period of when we had changed our mind on how we wanted to do it in the future. And he had planned on keeping a puppy from that. And, we talked to him a little bit about it and he said, Nope, I want them removed. I'm getting a puppy from it. I do not want the dew claw on there. And mm-hmm. I remember that was a bit of a deal breaker for us, for both parties. And we, when we went to exchange dogs, he was petting one of our other ones. And he said, well, you don't have dew, cl- dew claws on this one. Hers are removed. And, um, and then we pointed out, no, they're right here. And and even he himself was surprised at how high and tight dew claws mm-hmm. are actually set. And he said, oh, yeah, well, then I'm fine with it. Let's do it. <laughs> right. But I, I think it's just because we're so used to, we were so used to not seeing that. And um, you have the idea of it's going to be an extra nail there. And it's going to be ugly, but it really isn't. In wire hairs, the hair hides them a good you know a nice tight wire coat will hide that in breeds like vishlas weimariners um english pointers you're gonna see that a little bit more yeah are you seeing people making a difference based on um the uh, the eye appeal yeah we we definitely have run into that same thing with the curly coats because we are a breed that there are quite a few imports and exports and so you know dew claw removal is very much a a u.s um, american thing Uh, many of the other countries the scandinavian european countries that i work with with the curlies um, they don't remove dew claws and so when i part of the reason that i made the decision personally for my curly coat litters was not even necessarily from a health standpoint or a function standpoint It's because I was exporting, you know, one puppy to two puppies each litter to a country where they would have stuck out like the sore thumb American dog um, when they went overseas. And so I've kind of been able to easily make this decision compared to some because I do have the the foreign and, and export and import type of mentality as well. And they just, they would, they would stick out. Most of their dogs or all of their dogs typically have their dew claws um, in most of those countries. And so, um, and then getting dogs and, you know, our breed is so small in the U.S. There's a lot of imports from all sorts of countries that come in regularly through all over the country. And um, we've had the same kind of conversations, you know, where people will say, oh, it's so not cosmetic um, to have dew claws. And I'm like, well, okay. And that last ring, you know, in the, in the best of breed class that you just watched who had dew claws and they don't, I know who they are because, you know, I know, you know, I'm paying attention to some other foreign pedigree. Most mm-hmm. people can 
to actually recall the the dogs that have dew claws. So in the curly coats, I don't see it as a that they notice um, having a dew claw or not, even though the original perception I think was very cosmetic. Now the the breeds that I have seen it in that the cosmetic becomes a functionality thing are the breeds, you know, like the the sled dogs and the greyhounds and such where it really the cosmetics turns into a a, a true functionality or or um, injury based um, decision making. So typically when we get into advantages or kind of reasons to or reasons not to, um, most of the people in the, the reasons to camp will talk about the nail trimming, you know, one less nail to trim, which isn't necessarily a, a big deal if you're, you know, having, you have one to three dogs, but if you have 200 dogs, you know, that that's a big deal that you have two less nails to trim on all, all of those 200 dogs, you know, certainly the, the ripped and, and broken concerns that I've had people express to me, um, the cosmetic, um, like you mentioned. And then, you know, one of the, the considerations that I think that should have some considerations put to it is that if you are going to do it, it's, it's a much um, easier and simple procedure when they are done at three to five days old versus two if, if needed to later. And so if that's a fully skeletally mature dog and you are having to remove it because of an injury, it is certainly more of a procedure. So it is a good conversation to have um, early on. Mm-hmm. Reasons not to do it is, you know, they were born with them, um, certainly as far as, you know, they, for many dogs, they have a purpose. Um, and, you know, there's certainly some in especially internationally thought about you know invasive and you know elective procedures not really being having a place in in the veterinary uh, medical world um and then certainly you know there's concerns about the carpus and the and digit injuries and things like that with dogs having them removed there's certainly been a lot of discussion around um dogs without do, do claws expir experientially um, and anecdotally um, talking about, you know, having more carpal arthritis issues and digit injuries and such. But at this point, um, at least personally, we don't have the literature to, to support that um, without a doubt. So I think the reasons to and not to still can kind of be a pro versus con pretty equal but for the people that it's not equal to you know either the reasons to use them or or to remove them or not to remove them it can be very polarizing as well but both parties can be equally right as long as they're doing it for their you know right purposes for their dog Mm -hmm. right um if if dogs do have do claws and do get injured Yep. What is something that we can do out in the field or when we get them back to the truck that we can treat that right away? Whether, so, I guess, I mean, regardless yeah. of whether it's a dew claw or whether it's another digit, since, since it sounds like the other inner digits going to be more common anyhow, what can we do to help that? So broken toenails are a significant bummer um, just in general. I mean, it, that can be a bummer whether it's, you're hunting that day, whether you're competing either in the show ring or in any sport, because, you know, it's just like us, you know, you get a hangnail, you're, you know, but you're walking on that hangnail. So um, they can get infected, they can be source of bleeding, they can be all, in all sorts of sources of pain. And so, you know, first recognizing it, you know, your dog may be limping, might be painful, might be swollen on a digit. So getting used to what's normal. So when your dog's not injured and in the field, inspecting all their feet really well, expect inspecting their nail beds, especially your, your hairier breeds and their feet, um, getting right down under the hair and really ins- getting comfortable with inspecting things, I think is the best thing you can do. And then when they get injured, then it may be a matter of, you know, protecting that area. So you might have to put a a temporary bandage over that area until you can get it addressed or, um, you know, depending on how either broken or split it is, it may be a matter of trimming them back, um, cleaning up the area. And then certainly if you ever do encounter an actual, you know, ripped out where there's significant bleeding um, from one of the vessels attached to that area, um, that's a, you know, get a bandage on and, and get, um, to your, you know, closest emergency place. Cause there are some, 
you know, very significant vessels in that area that doesn't necessarily have to completely do with you just ripped your dew claw, but um, right under the skin in that area, if they are going to um, lacerate themselves or, or torque in that area, there can be some significant injury. So knowing your local emergency places, having some um, bandage material that you could place a fairly firm bandage on that area. I'm not going to say, you know, tourniquet um, kind of recommendations unless you absolutely need to, um, but being able to get someplace fast and, and recognize when it is an emergency is really the best thing you can do, in my opinion. And, you know, being able to have your dogs be comfortable with their feet being messed with so you could, you know, trim up a broken nail or, you know, get a grass on out between toes or do something like that. You got to know normals before the crisis happens and then having your dog comfortable to it um, makes a big difference. You could quick do it on a tailgate and not have it be a, a big battle in itself. Mm -hmm. And there, I do remember there is a bit of a learning curve from having dogs that don't have dew claws because you're such right. in that routine of, I, we dremel, we've always dremeled nails to, you know, so they get that rounded, um, rounded end and it gets tighter down but from going through all the dogs without dew claws to going to the ones that did have them you we would often forget oh shoot that one has dew claws oh, yeah. i had to go back and get that and and they it completely defeats having it uh, mm -hmm. for the purpose if if it's not going to be um, taken care of because I know the couple when I was working at the vet clinic you'd see some dogs come in and their dew claws would be wrapped all the way around in a circle Mm -hmm. going into their pad. Exactly. And so, you know, that's the, if you look at a, a dog like that, you know, that dog having its dew claws removed at three to five days old might have been the best answer for that dog and that person for its entire mm -hmm. life. But it, once you're comfortable trimming those nails, um, they're, you know, it can be part of the routine as well. Um, so there's certainly pluses mm -hmm. and minuses. Um, on both sides of the fence as well. But because they're not minute by minute in contact with the ground, they definitely do need trimming. And, and like the agility paper in, from 2018 says, definitely trimming your dog's nails, um, at least in that sport, um, helps with digit injuries more than anything. So, you know, keeping them trimmed. And it, it's, you know, when it comes to cosmetic things, I mean, the, even the, I don't know if you've ever been um, scraped by your dog's dew claw, but they, when they jump yeah. up on you and they have no manners and they're, they're being obnoxious, mm -hmm. you know, you could be gouged by that thing. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, because the they Broncos. do, Whew. because they do use them. You know I mean? They, yeah. they, when they, you know, when they're not that any of our dogs would ever be obnoxious, but <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, I don't think my dogs have had dew claw injuries, but definitely mm -hmm. I've had injuries from their two claws right uh, yeah they but, dig you in, know once again sure. we're all we're all here because we usually put our dogs before us as far as nutritionally grooming um exercise everything so yeah, yeah. definitely make those decisions for my dogs more than me usually so right well and i think this topic and while it um it's by no means a new concept of do claws or no do claws, but it seems like there's still quite a bit of room for research on it to really be able oh, to absolutely. give facts. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. And one of the neatest things that I've seen on the, when I was researching this topic years ago was a YouTube video of golden retrievers. And I think it was just a golden retriever owner that was taking videos of dogs with and without do claws that fell through the ice mm -hmm. and of them being able to pull themselves out of it. Mm -hmm. it have you seen that one? Oh yeah. 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 It's, yeah, it's definitely a popular one for it's, sure. It's interesting. And he just kind of did his own little study and see, I, I mean, right. You have to wonder if there was any kind of bias in it, even though he looked like he had a pretty good control theory on it, but it was but, neat to see. So one of the things, do claws or not, um, that is extremely interesting um, that uh, I find the students just fascinated by every single time that I present it is, 
you know, all of us that, you know, have these sporting breeds and really any dog, you know, running, going for a Frisbee, you know, any pet dog, any size of dog, anything like that, it all happens so fast. And so you don't even realize what's going through their, their body as you do it. And so watching some of the slow motion videos of movement of dogs, um, that I think is, is extremely fascinating, whether, whether it's the Duclaw topic or not. Um, certainly in this topic, just the fact that the dew claws do make contact with the ground are interesting. But, you know, that little pad that's, you know, up high, you know, behind the dew claw, behind that, that part of that, the front leg, knowing that that actually has a function and, you know, seeing actually how dog mechanics work, even if you're on the side of, you know, removing dew claws, which is perfectly 100% A-OK to me, it, just knowing the mechanics of your dog and, and trying to protect um, some of these structures like the carpus or the that wrist up there from long-term injury um, with some of the things that we're asking these dogs to do on a routine basis, you know, all the running down hills and the jumping out of trucks and the, you know, retrieves and the, you know, things that they're coming down on their carpuses quite hard every single day of their life. And so, you know, dew claws or not, if they're, if the dew claw helps protect it a little bit, great. Um, but really there's, you know, not letting your dog get fat um, is way more protective of those joints than anything we know about dew claws leaving them or not. So there's so many things about this topic that, as we're delved into it and watching all these videos and, and some of the, you know, great um, experience, experience um, based um, literature that's, you know, based on Google searches and things like that can still be fascinating and useful and valuable as we make this decision as well as so many others. Um, so it's mm -hmm. quite a, quite a fascinating um, anatomy to look at um, when we slow videos down and things like that. It is, especially those agility videos. Oh, yeah. Those are really cool, seeing them go through the weave poles and mm -hmm. um, the jumping and the quick turns of how much they're really using their bodies and their, their little feet. <laughs> yeah, and, and how certain breeds, whether it's in the field or in the agility ring or, you know, certain sizes of dogs or breeds or anything or different structures, even within a breed sometimes can be just better for certain things than others. And certain individuals within that breed can just be better at it than others. That's why mm -hmm. people are, are better for ballet versus, you know, quarterbacks versus, you know, whatnot. Um, some of that, you know, it's, it'd be easy to, to go back and say, oh, it's because they had their dew claws or not had their dew claws. But a lot of it comes down to their, their structure and their individualness and their body condition score and, you know, what all that dog was doing through its entire life as far as other illnesses and everything else. So um, until we are able to, to really tease it all out, um, being the most educated people can be about the topic, I think is is extremely valuable and I never ever have a problem with a client you know questioning me and my recommendation and having this discussion if they also have strong feelings about it because it's it can be right for them and, and that might be totally different than than what I'm dealing with with my own dogs and my own mm -hmm. patient population. Right and I think even uh, the difference in terrains hunting throughout the United States if, oh, if yeah. a, breed, a breeder on the east coast or down south versus um, you know those out west that are climbing the checker hills it's it and, and where those dogs are going that can make a difference too of what's going to be more advantage to that type of terrain mm -hmm. and and if your last dog you know was crippled with carpal arthritis and that shortened its career, then you might be looking at the situation different than someone that, you know, had a, a horrible injury to a front leg and, you know, had significant hemorrhage in the field and had the trauma of that versus someone that, you know, has not ever had anything like that and can really make the decision just based on um, what feels the best. And I know, um, making decisions on feelings is usually nothing I like to do, um, but that's really often 
times where we're at with a lot of these topics and right. um, having open conversations with as many people as you possibly can. Um, and also from other sports. I mean, we've learned so much from our greyhound and our sled dog um, colleagues um, that have helped our bird dogs out tremendously in the areas of nutrition and, and exercise physiology and all sorts of, of things that um, it's easy to kind of get stuck in our little silo of bird dogs um, and, and not always, you know, be the overall working or sporting dog. Right. I completely agree. Absolutely. And, well, and our international counterparts as well, you know, they're, they also have terrain and they also have all these things and they're not removing dew claws. And so um, mm-hmm. learned so much from my international um, colleagues. And when I say colleagues, I mean my fellow handlers and dog people and breeders and such like that going overseas and competing with my own dog, one of the curlies in a hunt test in Finland was just mind blowing for me how they um, did, you know, the, the game, you know, they don't have pen raised birds, um, all the differences in their tests and their hunting compared to ours um, was a huge game changer for me. And then when you get into topics such as dew claws and all sorts of other um, discussion points, Mm -hmm. then, you know, my mind really was kind of opened up to really making some of these decisions with a little more um, deliberateness um, for what works best for me and my own dogs. Right. Absolutely. And I know, um, you know, I have friends in the UK that are just going to laugh that we're even having to have this discussion on (laughs) Duke Claws. I I had, I had to come over, um, actually on the very last litter that we took them off of during the process, they were there with us and they just, they were horrified and they're like, mm-hmm. why are you doing this? How dare mm-hmm. you? Um, we, we believe in them on for generations. And, um, uh, but another thing I wanted to talk about there is, I have heard um, a concern that we've been taking them off for so long here. They've been coming off for generations. How do we know if this next litter that we leave them on that they're not going to be floppy, loose dew claws? The floppy, loose ones, you can tell pretty early on. Like if you've, if you've ever had a litter that has front and rear, even within, you know, that first week of life, they feel different. I mean, they're, they're very much more attached versus not. And so um, certainly any of those things are a possibility, kind of like, um, I, I, I certainly a whole nother discussion, but um, that same thing comes up when like we go from leaving tails and, you know, not leaving tails and things like that. Like maybe we've had right. the earliest tails in the breed for the history of the breed, but right. we didn't know that um, until yes. we started leaving them. Um, but really with dew claws, I just haven't seen that to be a, um, a problem. I mean, and they just, they feel different right from the get go um, if they're going to be an issue. So, you know, if, if I encountered a puppy where it really, they didn't feel attached pretty early on, maybe I'd be um, a little more apt to consider removing them early um, as a potential problem. But for one, the floppy front ones seem to be so rare in general um, and they really do feel different. So I think you could probably identify the ones of concern still quite early um, if, if that was a concern. Mm-hmm. And I haven't personally seen them in bird dogs, at least, where they're um, more floppy and loose front dew claws. Correct. Well, and and some mixed breed pet dogs that I've encountered in practice that have elected to have dew claws, front dew claws or rear dew claws removed um, later in life because of floppiness um, Mm -hmm. or attachment. Oftentimes we can do that at the time of another procedure. So you know, they might not have had influence in that dog when it was three to five days old, but at six months of age, you know, up to a year of age when we're considering spay neuter or things like that. Um, and once again, totally separate topic. Um, we can do it at a, at a that procedure. So it's not a, a another anesthesia and things like that. So it's not like, you know, seven years down the road, you're going to all of a sudden say, oh, my dog has too floppy of a dew claw and find somebody to remove it. But if it is identified as a problem early on, there are some um, still quite reasonable options, in my opinion, to, to re- 
um, address that concern earlier on um, than, you know, than just waiting and not doing it at all. Right. And does that, so if you do have dew claws um, removed at a, yep. at a later age after you have ownership of them and you just decide, I, I don't want these. Um, is that right. a, is that a procedure that goes okay? Is that pretty it, easy on the dogs? It, it it's not it's certainly not as easy as day three to five by any means. Um, okay. The bony attachment is is more bony, um, more skin to heal things like that. And there um, is you know it is in an area where you wouldn't want the dog to rip out stitches and such. So the the owner compliance with uh, keeping that area protected, um, keeping them from being able to lick or ch- do at it through the time of their sutures and also some pretty strict leash restrictions. That's another reason why oftentimes we'll consider doing that at the time of, you know, a, a very hysterectomy or neuter or something where all those recommendations would still be in place as well. So um, it is something that um, can be a hassle um, for those two weeks, but um, certainly nothing that I've seen major complications from other than just annoying complications. And they, the complications I've seen have been um, the fact that the dog gets to it, you know, so tries to chew out st- stitches because it's a very convenient area for the dog to reach. Um, and so, and with that being said, I, I certainly don't want to minimize the invasiveness of the procedure. I mean, I'm talking about general anesthesia with appropriate preemptive multimodal analgesia and pain control and such like that. This isn't a, you know, light sedation and I'm just going to, you know, pull this, you know, quick little thing out your, you know, foot. This is a surgical procedure and should be taken as seriously. But with all those things in place, I have not seen complications other than dogs getting at the sutures themselves. Okay. Okay. Is there anything else on dew claws that you think that we need to cover yet? I don't think so. I would just, I would, no matter what anybody's practice is with their own dogs or what they have a preference of, I would just kind of have them go through the same kind of discussion with themselves as far as why they do it, pros and cons, and weighing all the options, being open to change. Um, If something changes their mind, either going from or doing it or or not, um, and just continue to pay attention to all these topics and be skeptical. I mean, um, I, this is going to sound, you know, strange, but I think that everybody should be skeptical of any kind of blanket statement. So if somebody says you always have to do this or never do this, I think you should be very skeptical about those things because we don't, um, have the kind of information that makes it this or many of our our situations that we deal with um, a black and white um, answer and you just have to stay up on literature and keep changing with your own past experiences and I think talk to as many people as absolutely possible and this goes for all sorts of topics that we delve into so um, but at the end of the day you're the only one that that has to sleep at night with your recommendations and um, if you're okay with it and have a reason behind it, then I typically am going to a hundred percent support you on it as well. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. You're very welcome. Sharing all this with us today. Happy to help. Very good. Very good stuff. Um, Well, you go enjoy the warm weather you're having today. And I'm glad that I didn't hear that siren stop directly behind your vehicle. (laughs) No, all good. All good. (laughs) And be sure to give that handsome starch a pat and a kiss for me. Absolutely. Happy to do that. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Oof. How good was that? Dr. Sarah Schild bring us all the considerations to keep in mind regarding leaving or removing dew claws. You can see why it's been such a highly discussed topic in the bird dog community. And like so many other topics, breeders and owners are apt to make decisions based on personal experiences. So do what's best for you and your breeding program. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something from the content, please share it with your friends. 
Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast in whichever platform you're listening from. Check out the show notes for links to references from this episode, as well as info on how to connect through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're loving this podcast and want to support the production and content, please consider becoming one of my Patreon patrons. I am in the process of amping up this program and give my patrons some awesome insider content and discounts. Let's build a community of bird dog babes together. I want to hear from you about topics, guests, and maybe we do some Zoom discussions and questions and answers from our past and previous guests. $5 per month and you're in. And as always, 2% goes to conservation. The link to become a Patreon patron is in the show notes uh, on my website, thebirddogbabe.com, or just search the Patreon patron website. Until next time, bird dog babes, keep them versatile.